So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy that we can welcome Mahi van Kreve to this lecture today. And thank you, Mahi, very much for being here today, although unfortunately only via Zoom. Uh, I hope we can see you again personally in Trier in about in a few months next year, in the not too distant future. And I hope that you will support our poetry project in future too, because now we are writing the application for the second period this summer. And I would like to invite you to participate in our project and to help us a little bit with conferences, conference planning and so on. I think I, or we will contact you later in a few weeks um, to talk with you, to discuss um, the topics you can collaborate on with us. But um, first of all, we are now looking forward to your lecture. And Christian will briefly introduce you and moderate the, your presentation. So I will give the floor now to Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I would just want to give a brief introduction to Machir. I think most of us who are dealing with Chinese studies know him already very well, but we have a few people here who are from different disciplines. Uh, Machiel van Krevel got his PhD from Leiden University and he uh, studied also for several years in the People's Republic of China and worked in Australia and since 1999 he is full professor for Chinese language and literature at Leiden University and an outstanding specialist on contemporary poetry. Also a very prolific writer who is producing almost one book per year at an amazing speed. His most recent contributions uh, <laughs> are, for example, walk on, the wild si walk on the Wild Side, giving snapshots of several Chinese poets. It appeared in 2017 and more recent uh, uh, publication on Chinese poetry and translation, which appeared in 2019. Uh, both of these books can be found online, so you can just download them if you're interested. And today he will give a talk on bedless poetry or so-called migrant worker poetry. And we are looking very for, uh, um, forward, Mahir, to what you are uh, telling us now. So the floor uh, or the screen is yours. Yeah, all right. <laughs> So, and uh, one note, I would ask everybody who is not talking to turn off their microphones um, to improve the sound quality, but uh, you can keep the video on, that's no problem, but uh, switch off the microphones, please. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me and great to be here. I should warn you, uh, all of you, uh, that Henrike was very generous uh, to me, so she gave me 60 minutes. Um, and I intend to use all of them. So if you want to get some popcorn or, you know, whatever else you need to survive a 60 minute talk, this is uh, the moment. No, but seriously, um, <clears throat> today's presentation comes uh, from an ongoing project. It's an unpublished paper. Uh, there's a lot of material. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is to really sort of go into the material and at the same time, take a step back, obviously, and try and contextualize it um, in a bigger picture that is perhaps not only of interest to people studying Chinese literature, but uh, other literatures and in fact, other disciplines as well. So we'll talk more about this poem later on. Um, I hope you've uh, had an opportunity to have a quick look at this being academics. I know you cannot not read, so you've all read it by now. And we'll move straight on into uh, the actual material. So this is Xiao Hai, uh, the poet who is at the center of today's presentation. This is a picture taken in 2017, and I should begin by saying that Xiao Hai um, is a poet, a migrant worker poet. Is there a problem? No? Okay. I got, I got something that sounded like an emergency signal, but it wasn't me. 
Um, so I'll just continue, I guess. Yeah? yeah. Okay, so I should begin by saying that what Xiaohai writes and what he is part of is a larger movement uh, known as uh, migrant worker poetry. My currently favorite translation of this term is battler's poetry. Uh, I won't go into that for now. And probably if we look at foreign translations and introductions of this migrant worker poetry, uh, this is a key text, an anthology in English translation edited by Qin Xiaoyu and translated by Eleanor Goodman. It came out in 2017. And so the definitional issues are kind of complicated as they should be. Um, but the bottom line is basically that this is mostly poetry written by migrant workers, domestic migrant workers, rural to urban migrant workers in China, who've been on the move since the 1980s and their number is close to about 300 million by now across that uh, 40 year period. And usually this poetry is also considered to be about the migrant worker experience. And this is a definition that I will stick with. Uh, there is debate about this. There are people who ask, you know, can you write battlers poetry or migrant workers poetry if you are not a migrant worker yourself? This is the kind of thing that speaks to special interest literatures, often to do with marginalization and empowerment, and of course also to do with issues of authenticity and ownership and appropriation. Um, so for the moment, in an ongoing project uh, on this battlers poetry, I'm sticking with a simple definition that says it's by migrant workers, and it is about the migrant worker experience. Now, this particular story today about Xiaohai um, is linked very closely um, to a place called Pitun, uh, geographically, that's just the name of a village outside Beijing, on the outskirts of Beijing to the northeast, located very close to the airport, one of the airports. Um, about two decades ago, there were roughly two to 3,000 people living in that village, and now there are between 30 and 40,000. And so um, the additional tens of thousands of inhabitants are all migrant workers who have flocked to this migrant worker village, which is a fairly recent phenomenon in China with this influx of rural workers into the cities. Now the um, place called Pitun is famous because it is um, home to an NGO working on labor, very influential and increasingly visible, not just in China, but also internationally. And the name of the NGO is the Migrant Workers Home or Gong Yu Zhijia in Chinese. And what they do is they try and advance social identification of migrant workers um, and a, the impartment of a sense of pride, of having a social identity, of feeling that you deserve a place under the sun um, in the People's Republic of China. This is not a self-evident matter because migrant workers are a demographic um, that is much discussed because of their deprivileged position, uh, because of their precarious position precarious labor, issues like that. But the special thing about the migrant workers' home in Pitun is that what they try to do um, is to advance this social identification and the establishing of an identity through what they call cultural education, in Chinese. And culture is a very broad notion in this respect. So it means things like awareness of your rights as a laborer, as well as things like cultural production. And so the calling card of this migrant workers home is a rock band, a folk rock band uh, established by the original activists in the early 2000s. Uh, they, they are called Sun Heng, uh, Xu Duo and Wang Dezhi. Uh, these are three of the sort of core people and we will encounter them later on again. And so what you see here on the screen is a theater called the New Worker Theater that's actually on the premises of the NGO. And it's one of the examples of the cultural education that the Migrant Workers Home tries to deploy. The Pitun brand, if you will, of grassroots worker culture became internationally famous um, when in 2017, um, this female migrant worker, Fan Yu Su, who you see on the cover of a, a journal here, uh, made headlines first in China and then internationally when she published an autobiographical piece called My Name is Fan Yu Su basically relating the story, a very individual story of you know, her, uh, her life um, and what it had led to and how she had ended up as a migrant worker in Beijing and more specifically in Pitun. If you wanna know more about Pitun and cultural education, that sort of thing with apologies for blowing my own trumpet, uh, 
Um, but the easiest thing is to Google debts and then just add my name and you'll find this article. It's open access and you can read more about the Migrant Worker Museum, for example, and also about poetry. Now, as for today's um, itinerary, this is the entrance to the NGO, to the Migrant Workers' Home. Um, what I would like to do is first to look at some uh, of Xiaohai's prose, then move on to his poetry, um, then move on to his persona. Uh, I do hope you can actually see the Prezi well, because um, some, of, some of the Zoom issues are getting in my way, but uh, never mind. And then move on to a discussion of what I will call shared spaces uh, following Dai Jinghua, uh, uh, a Chinese scholar at Peking University. And I'll wrap up with some brief reflection on scholarship on this uh, fairly new phenomenon. Now, the um, prose that I will talk about when I talk about uh, Xiao Hai's, uh, let's say, prose writing is really just two brief recollections, autobiographical recollections that he has uh, written, recently published. And that makes a lot of sense because he only started to publish these recollections after he had become locally famous. So. Prior to this, he wrote poetry, and we will look at the poetry in a minute, but he's also been publishing these prose recollections, and they are called I Write Poetry Inside the Factory, and then Confessions of an Overage Failed Young Man. If we look at these essays, we see three important topics, and the first one is one that I would summarize as the battler's ordeal. And when you think of the battler's ordeal, migrant worker life, um, you, you have to think of things like, you know, a lack of civil rights, um, physically heavy labor, menial labor, uh, overtime, underpay, uh, very little in the way of labor rights, but also psychological and mental issues that come with displacement, with alienation, with leaving the countryside, going to the cities, uh, split families, not quite becoming uh, a citizen in the city because these people often don't have the same rights as city residents. So um, the battle is ordeal. And Chao Hai is a very good example. He left home at age 15, left school at age 15 because the family couldn't afford schooling for him anymore uh, in Henan in central China, then traveled to southeast China to the workshop of the world uh, in Shenzhen, and then spent the next 13 years or so um, working in factories, usually at the assembly line um, in about 10 different cities in China until he made his way to Pichun and that kind of started a new chapter in his life. So there are three stages according to himself in this period of time. The first stage he was, uh, he says, was characterized by disorientation and confusion. The second by loneliness and helplessness and the third by desperation and collapse. The second um, theme in his prose recollections is writing. And this is not your standard fare in the stories of migrant workers. In absolute numbers, there are many, many migrant workers who write. Uh, poetry is perhaps the most prominent genre, but there's also fiction and other things like, you know, digital video making and other cultural production. But in relative terms, of course, these people are a small minority. And what Xiaohai says about his writing is kind of ambivalent. So on the one hand, writing is a way of surviving for him, surviving the battler's ordeal. He writes poetry, he writes song texts, he's crazy about rock and roll, and not just Chinese rock and roll, but also foreign rock and roll. So, you know, the Rolling Stones, uh, rock and roll is used very broadly here. Uh, the Beatles, um, uh, Pink Floyd, he talks a lot about these, you know, big bands that are kind of, kind of old already, but uh, have made their way into Chinese canonization as well. And so uh, he writes poetry and song texts, and he does this during work whenever he can, and also outside work, but work is often very long hours. I mean, it's not at all an exception to work 12 or 14 hours a day. And so there's many stories about this, about supervisors finding out that he writes poetry, tearing up his work, and then him kind of, you know, fishing his poetry out of the dustbin and uh, putting things back together, uh, going to an internet cafe after work to input his poetry, uh, so as to make sure that he would actually retain it. And the writing is therapeutic. It's a means of survival. But at the same time, it is very clearly connected to the desire to be an artist. And not just a Chinese artist, but also, like I said, um, the desire for connecting with people outside China. And in the field of poetry, um, he identifies very strongly with Allen Ginsberg, uh, 
probably because of how uh, Ginsburg, Ginsburg's famous, probably his most, most famous work and a classic in China. At the same time, however, he portrays this writing, this urge to write as an obsession. And he also says that it is an obsession that made him an outsider in the factory. So for example, he says, I talked to my fellow workers about Li Bai, the great Chinese Tang Dynasty poet. I talked to them you know, about foreign poetry, about my contemporary favorites in China. And what they say is, yeah, great, but what does this have to do with our lives? So what's the point, right? It makes him an outsider. And in his own words, it makes him a failure in terms of forgetting about socioeconomic betterment. So he says in this quote, which you've been looking at when other people were thinking about, you know, buying a house, finding a partner, building a family, I was just, you know, thinking about song text. And he calls himself a failure for that reason. So there's, there's very interesting ambivalence here. And perhaps if we take a step back, one more thing to observe here is that in his vision of the artist, what we see is on the one hand, something that is very much an individualist romanticism. And that is easily linked to things like the solitary genius that is the poet. But on the other hand, we see a very class conscious effort at social advocacy, at testimony through poetry, at addressing issues of social justice through his poetry. So there's an interesting ambivalence here. Of course, it's not unknown, but it is worth noting. And the third big topic in his prose is Pitun as salvation. And I'm not overusing this term. There are actually terms like salvation and redemption um, in Xiaohai's prose. He talks about Pitun as a place that gave him a normal life. And he describes how he's nothing less than astonished when he gets there and finds out that there's a museum in Pitun about migrant worker culture and art, that there is a theater, and of course, that there is a literature group. So this literature group has been in existence since 2014. Um, they advertised on social media, trying to find um, volunteer academics in the Peking area, Beijing area, uh, to teach. And the most important teacher since 2014 has been Zhang Huiyu, uh, affiliated with Peking University, who started going to Pitun and teaching on Saturday or Sunday nights, typically on a wide range of topics. And over the years, he's built a large network of people who volunteer to teach in Pitun. And in recent years, this has also included um, foreign-based academics, um, yours truly among them. So I had the opportunity last year to lecture in Pitun, and I spoke about foreign images of battlers poetry as this is perceived outside China. The literature group also produces publications. Um, two series, um, one that started in 2015, that is called Pitun uh, Literature in English Translation, has been ongoing, and another that started in 2019. So you've just seen this cover called The New Worker Literature with Fan Yu Su on the cover here. And the difference between these two is that the former is really kind of showcasing writings by people who are associated with the literature group in Pitun. And the latter also solicits contributions from people who are outside Pitun and is more externally oriented. But um, nevertheless, for both of these, it is true that they are unofficial publications. And this is something we should bear in mind. There is a formidable tradition of unofficial publishing in China. Um, and I'll return to this issue later on when we talk about connections between grassroots culture and state discourse. In the former series, there was also a collection of Xiaohai's poetry called Howl in the Factory with a reference to Allen Ginsberg there. And probably at this point, I should say something about this notion of the new worker. So this journal is called New Worker, Xin Gongren Wenxue, Literature. And the new worker is a term and a notion that was launched by the Migrant Workers Home, by the NGO, in order to make something of a counter bid to terms like Nomingong in Chinese, peasant worker, uh, or da gongzhe, which I translate as battler, especially the former of these counts as pejorative. Uh, the da gongzhe, the battler, is ambivalent. There are people who wear this as a badge of pride, but the new worker is very much meant to impart a sense of pride that comes with that social identification that I've mentioned before. Now, when we talk about salvation, um, something that Xiaohai mentions in his writing as something that happened to him in Pitun, 
This is something that happens through literature, but it is not limited to literature. So the salvation that he describes is to do with big issues like self-esteem, like feeling that you are a worthy uh, member of this uh, society. And so it takes us straight to this perennial issue of what we could sum up as word and world in literature. How do texts relate to realities on the ground if we dare to use that word? Now, I am not one of those who believe that genres like migrant worker poetry are simply, you know, um, the documentation of a particular life experience that happens to take the form of literature. So I am not one of those who believe that this literature is the predictable product of circumstance. On the other hand, um, the very intense presence of historical context in this literature makes it difficult for practitioners and commentators alike not to make explicit the social, political, and ideological implications that are linked to a topic such as social injustice to do with migrant workers or the migrant worker experience more broadly in China. So in Xiaohai's work, there is not really a clear dividing line between the word and the world, as it were. Um, but the interesting question then becomes, what does that world look like in his writing? Now here I've got a quote for you. And what happens in this quote, very interestingly, is that we see two discourses that are very different kind of in confluence, in interaction, um, almost seamlessly connected. The one discourse is basically high socialist discourse. If you call yourself, if you compare yourself to a screw in the machine, each screw is important. Selfless sacrifice for the advancement of the common good, that kind of thing, a very classical socialist metaphor, um, then that pertains to that type of discourse. On the other hand, we see that what he says is that through his own efforts, he has found a way out. He talks about a neoliberal kind of self-reliance. And of course, neoliberalism is a discourse that is very much present in China um, today. So you see these things kind of connecting in interesting ways. And then both of them unfold within the scope aligned by something called the Chinese dream, which is, of course, the calling card of uh, ideology, the ideological direction and the ideological discourse and slogans currently used under the Xi Jinping regime. And what I would like to end this section with is to say that I don't believe this gesturing toward mainstream discourse is some kind of lip service. I think it's much more complicated than that. Okay, so let's have a look at the poetry, at Xiao Hai's poetry. Now, the first thing to say here is that it's very versatile. So if you look at his work and you compare it to other battler poets, you'll be struck by the fact that he does very many different things. There's a lot of experimentation going on, in other words. Uh, a lot of the early work is very unconstrained, uh, long poems, long lines, not a lot of attention to form. And in recent years, um, there's a growing number of um, poems that are more sort of trimmed down um, that give the reader the impression that composition has become a more conscious process. I'd like to note here that what I'm trying to do here is not to establish some kind of teleological narrative that says, look, here we have the noble savage, the migrant worker who has entered, you know, the sacred realm of literature and who is now picking up speed and finally reaching maturity. That's not what I'm trying to say. Um, the versatility of the oeuvre is something to look into in and of itself. And of course, these issues take us into the vexed matter of aesthetics. And more specifically, in the face of something like migrant worker poetry, the issue of aesthetic expectations and assessments. I don't believe this is a question that just matters to scholars. Um, I think it matters to translators as well, a great deal, and to teachers. And of course, these three capacities often coincide in the same human bodies, but still. And I also believe that it matters to readers. And what I'll say about it at this point is that um, the way that this migrant worker poetry has developed in China, but by the way, also in other places in the world, and there's interesting examples elsewhere as well, but it's kind of big in China, um, shows us that we shouldn't be taking these things for granted. And I guess that's probably the main takeaway from looking at that issue at this point. Now, if you look at the themes and the emotions in Xiaohai's poetry, what I've done here is to basically go through his oeuvre and draw up a list uh, 
So I'm just going to read that out from my notes now. It's not a pretty picture. On themes, these include love of the motherland. Well, that is a pretty picture, of course. Sometimes coupled with inequality, but as seen from China as the workshop of the world vis-a-vis -vis foreign consumers. Displacement, alienation, um, notions of exile to do with leaving one's native place. This holds for domestic exile as well as for international exile, of course. Loss and failure and also unrequited romantic love. So, you know, not a pretty picture, like I said, with the exception perhaps of love of the motherland, if we take that to be a pretty uh, picture in itself. The emotions that um, are associated with these themes throughout the poetry um, paint a pretty grim picture as well. Indignation and anger, disappointment, disillusionment, um, desperation and bitterness, and contempt for the self and guilt. So this kind of relates back to what I showed you just now in these reflections on uh, his trajectory. When we talk about poetry, and certainly in a context like this, but I would hold also in other contexts, of course, we need to talk about translation as well. And I'm going to blow my own trumpet again for a moment if you indulge me. Um, I've coined an aphorism here. It's been happening for a couple of years. It changes over time, but currently it reads, translation is choosing which rule to break, right? The translation of poetry, that is. And as I was reflecting on this in the context of battlers poetry, migrant worker poetry, and there's some very good scholarship on this stuff out there already, I was wondering if it would be completely ridiculous to say, the rule that I wish to break when I translate migrant worker poetry is the rule that says, pay attention to lexical detail Yes, I realize that's kind of a weird thing to say when you talk about translation and certainly about poetry translation, but I still kind of get that feeling. And it is to do with what this poetry does to me and what it does to me as a scholar and a translator and somebody who wants to disseminate it as well and talk about it. And then, you know, while I'm at it, I might make another ridiculous claim or hypothesis or minimally contestable, debatable. I also feel that migrant worker poetry is relatively speaking, more excerptable than other poetry. I personally, I'm very much in favor of citing a poem in full in its entirety whenever you have the opportunity. And yet I feel that in writing about battlers poetry, I feel that I'm more at liberty to excerpt this poetry. But this in itself raises a very interesting question. It might raise questions about my inclinations as an academic to, for example, ennoble the texts or to pick the stuff that I've been trained to like. So, you know, we can leave this for the Q&A. Now, if we look at some of um, the actual poetry, um, you had a quick look at the poem called Chinese Workers already at the very beginning of my presentation when I desperately tried to kind of string out the introduction so that you could actually read this poem. Um, not going to go into the full quote here, but you've got the Chinese worker there who writes about, you know, products that have made in China on them. Um, that flow across the four seas and the seven lands. And then I want to send a letter across the Pacific to these golden haired, blue eyed yuppies, right? And ask them why the sun at dawn, presumably in China, is covered in black clouds. So of course, at this point, it also bears noting that the people who use products that are made in China are not only across the Pacific, they're also in China. There is a middle class in China that, you know, depending on who you talk to, uh, is to the tune of 300 or 350 million people, and they buy iPhones as well. Anyway, that's an aside, really. What we see here is global capitalism as a driver of China's precarious labor. We see a reassertion of the dignity of the Chinese nation in the face of that. And if we look at the style, this very distinctly recalls the political lyricism, uh, in Chinese, that was the style of the high socialist state-driven and state-sanctioned politically orthodox poetry of the Mao Zedong era. And I'm sure there are connections here with, for example, Soviet poetry and poetries elsewhere um, in the world. The next poem that I'd like to bring to your attention just very briefly is called Nonfiction. Now for this one, I'm just gonna read it to you because I thought that was gonna work better than putting it on the screen. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction. First of all, Xiao Hai plays on a debate on the genre of nonfiction, Fei Xu Go, in Chinese, that is currently happening in China. It's been 
a big topic for a long time in China, and especially in connection to migrant worker cultural production, there's very interesting discussions on nonfiction. And so what he does in the poem is there is now some attention to form, even though this form is limited to very insistent repetition. Okay, and you'll hear this as I read the poem. But also, he appropriates this term nonfiction to mean, you know, real as in the sense of physical experience um, in the battler's life, in the migrant worker's life. And then he contrasts that with uh, several sweet dreams that are fictional as in, you know, out of reach. So I'll read the poem to you. The non-fictional grind, the non-fictional workshop, non-fictional rejects, non-fictional overtime, the non-fictional cafeteria, the non-fictional dormitory, non-fictional youth, non-fictional drifting, non-fictional backache, non-fictional fatigue, non-fictional despair, non-fictional aging, non-fictional poverty, non-fictional single, non-fictional lonely, non-fictional failure, only freedom, love, dignity, and dreams are fictional. Fictional and as far out of reach as the magnificent Milky Way. Okay, you get the point. Now, the third poem, and what I try to do by showing you these three poems is obviously to sort of indicate what I call the versatility of this work, the fact that it's very multifaceted and experimental, is a long poem. Um, it's longer than the quote that's on your screen now, and it's called, When I Watched the World Cup, What Did I See? And what we see here is global capitalism as a driver of precarious labor in China has come back, but very different from you know, um, this poem, the Chinese workers, right? Very different from this poem. What we see in When I Watch the World Cup is um, actually a speaker who is alive from the first line, who, who is uh, a human being that you can relate to. Whereas in Chinese workers, I would venture that the speaker is really an abstraction and no more than that. So the speaker is alive in this poem and the indignation that resides in the poem, just like in Chinese workers, is also accompanied here occasionally by a hint of irony. Irony, for example, in that long title, when I watched the World Cup, what did I see? But also in something that you might wanna call a very puzzled gaze at the mad ways of the world in the poem. Then there is a very effective mise en scène. So the way that the poet juxtaposes watching this football spectacle of England versus Colombia, uh, the World Cup, you know, with advertisements around the pitch on the one hand, with the Chinese workers in factories where they produce these England and Colombia and all the other nations' jerseys, these football jerseys, not just for the teams, obviously, but for the fans, um, is very effective. So you see, you know, he says, Colombia, I don't even know where this is, but I know that in Human Dongguan, in the England football outfit factory, my workmates work around the clock to make the jerseys and so on and so forth. And then he says, these advertisements around the pitch, Coca-Cola, Adidas, Wanda, they have nothing to do with me. Youth slipped away is the only thing that's mine. And then he goes back to saying, you know, as I was watching TV, I stayed up all night because of the time difference. I look out the window and here is my surroundings, you know, near a factory, probably breakfast stalls, um, that kind of thing. On TV, the winners, the, the, the team that has won the match keeps doing victory laps while all that was left here in China are the workers making those jer jer uh, jerseys, silent and voiceless, slogging away with no breaks. Now the narrative um, that uh, emerges from poetry like this and more widely from this persona is something that we'll um, get into in a bit more detail after having reviewed uh, the big picture here. So the difference between poetry and prose in this regard, and partly this is a generic difference of course, is that I would venture, and again this is you know, perhaps a bit provocative, but I would say poetry cannot be commentarial even if it tries. In prose recollections, no matter how you write them up, in a sense, you are looking at the experience from the outside. I realize all of this is debatable, but that's what it's meant to be. Um, and in poetry, because of the very nature of the genre, whether it's migrant worker poetry or a Tang Dynasty quatrain or any poetry from anywhere, 
the fact that you know the genre is something that draws attention to language itself kind of sets apart language from the rest of our experience at that particular moment makes it impossible for poetry to be commentarial uh, in the core and that is i think also what explains that the message that comes from the poetry in Xiaohai is much more pessimistic than the message that comes from the prose if we link these things to the next chapter, to his persona, his public persona, first of all, we need to talk a little bit about what that persona is. Well, obviously the persona only starts to take uh, shape, to emerge in the public realm after Xiaohai gains some, some, some kind of local fame, some kind of local celebrity. That's probably not an exaggeration at this point. So it happens after he moves to Pitun, and I should first tell you how he even gets to Pitun. What happens is that in the mid 2010s, Xiaohai starts contacting Chinese rock stars on social media. So he writes to a whole bunch of famous singer songwriters and other musicians saying, I want to be in touch with you. I'm a poet. I've got stuff that I want to show you. And, you know, um, do you want to talk to me? And one of these people, Dung Tu, actually responds to him and becomes an online social media friend and then puts him in touch with Xu Duo, who is one of the three activists that I mentioned who founded the NGO in Pitun. To cut a long story short, in August 2016, Xiaohai settles in Pitun and, you know, describes his astonishment at what is there, the literature group, the museum, the music, um, everything that is there for migrant workers at no cost, as he does not fail to mention. So that's how he um, arrives there. And then this visibility of him as a poet after he joins the literature group is in part explained by the media genicity of the genre of Battler's poetry. So iconic images of Battler life, of migrant worker life in the PRC and in other places, robot-like human beings who are shackled to the assembly line. And I'm afraid that sometimes this is actually very close to the real situation um, in certain factories in China. Um, weathered faces uh, with yellow safety helmets, you know, on this huge construction site linked with the notion of poethood really speaks to the imagination. So somehow a migrant worker who is also a poet or who becomes a poet really kind of, you know, tickles people, not just in China, but elsewhere as well. You can tell in the media. But it's also to do with this visibility with the mediagenicity of this particular poet, okay? Um, Xiaohai is if you want your rock and roll migrant worker poet, not just because he likes rock music and he talks about that, but also, you know, because he wears uh, a backward baseball hat, um, because he uh, loves to talk about rock music, because he likes to write poetry that is like song texts and so on and so forth. And he very much has this image of, you know, Sturm und Drang, um, uh, the anger of a young person trying to make choices, being blocked and so on and so forth, especially in the poetry. And he's also a very gregarious person. He's wonderful to be around. So he's great to film, he's great to interview, he's great to talk to. Uh, he talks um, at a very high pace. Uh, so we'll look at a couple of minutes from a video clip and it's actually hard for the subtitles to keep up. But he's just a very sort of likable person. And so then what happens is that this very comfortably relatable person at the same time reminds his viewers and his readers of very uncomfortable issues to do with um, you know, the demographic of migrant labor uh, in China with these huge issues, some of them very directly linked to issues of social justice. So here you have a still taken from the China Daily. Now that is not some kind of you know, small social media operation, that is state media. So very interesting, we have an encounter of grassroots culture with state media, there is no conflict, right? There is a confluence of these things. What I'm gonna try, uh, try to do now, and I hope the you know, tech, uh, technology is gonna help us here, is to show you just a brief passage from this video clip. Okay. Sorry, screwed up. Was 
，二零零三年，然后七月二号，然后离开我们老家了，离开名城。我记得我也是第一次坐长途火车，觉得我挺上班挺认真的，但是还是感觉不到快乐。我觉得我仿佛从未青春就已苍老，就那样，就开就那样的一个状态下开始写东西，开始表达，开始找寻自我，然后几乎是从零七年以后，然后就走到哪里写到哪里，每个车间。呃，有一段时期，在一二年、一三年的时候，那时候我在车间里面，然后遇到了孩子的事以后，然后对我触动非常大，就可以说是一个很重要的精神支柱。啊，我也慢慢的也试着，然后去表达，在车间里表达自己我的喜怒哀乐。我最后我就想就叫个叫个小海吧，对，然后就就就,就比较比较比较简单，有一种很超越的力量。然后这个就是我的一个到皮宿舍以后，然后我们。老师，然后评委小组老师，然后帮我出的一个，就是内部出的一个诗集。我这个中国工程是二零一三年啊写的，一三年的时候我打工也十年了，打工十年了，觉得感觉到挺困惑的，然后就感觉到这不是自己想要的生活，一直在打工也没办法，所以当时也是这样一个状态，我写出了一个中国工程。Okay, back again. I hope you're still here. Um, so, um, you know, this is this is that video clip in the China Daily in uh, what I call the uh, state media, and there's plenty more of this stuff. Uh, so, for example, here is a still from something um, that can be found on YouTube. This is in 2017 when there were large-scale evictions of migrant workers going on in Beijing in November, and Xiao Hai kind of took the lead to recite a poem written by Yu Xiuhua. Uh, also often associated with things like subaltern writing and migrant worker writing in China to protest basically against these evictions. So it's also very much to do with this particular um, migrant worker poet. It's not just an issue of the genre. Um, thirdly, and certainly um, you know, not unimportantly, we shouldn't forget that Xiao Hai quite simply um, is a very talented author um, by all accounts. You talk to his fellow workers, you read in the scholarship, um, you look at his poetry, he's simply got a lot of talent. He's special in that um, respect. And then fourthly, if we look at his visibility and his celebrity, what I would like to mention is the fact that there is the community factor, or what you could also call the pizza and brand of grassroots worker culture. So this literature group has kind of been in the media. And typically what they do is they present themselves as a collective that is marked by solidarity and solidarity as an instrument to advance social identification. And then um, it's funny, you know, somebody do, should do an Excel sheet on this, uh, but I don't know how many pieces of this literature I've read where they mention other members of the literature group. And of course, depending on how uh, we view the world, one could see this as um, calculating behavior I'm not inclined to do so just yet. I think it is to do with the literary experience of being a member of that group and then perhaps also looking outward. Now the narrative that emerges from this persona of Xiao Hai is one of gratitude, patriotism, positive energy, very much a term that is also part of the ideological discourse promoted by the state. And it is not a narrative of protest or resistance. And I think this is noteworthy, if only because we need to get away from easy oppositions that assume that you know, you've got resistance on the one hand, and this is probably grassroots, and then you've got the state on the other, and that's probably oppression, right? So um, this is kind of my point of departure for talking about this a little bit. It subverts simple oppositions of grassroots and state culture, and also of official and unofficial discourse. So there is hardly any portrayal in this narrative, sometimes a little different from the poetry, of the battler's life as an injustice, right? Except vis-a-vis -vis these foreign consumers, even though lots of Chinese people in China buy iPhones as well. Uh, there is the hardship of precarious labor in the poetry, in the prose, but there is no blaming going on, right? And indeed, there is self-reproach. Um, the key to success is often phrased as initiative, perseverance, faith in the future. You will recall this from the quote where he says, we young people should believe that in the future we'll come closer to our dreams. Um, and the companionship of fellow workers. So, you know, not systemic social change. This is not portrayed as the key to success. Inequality in Chinese society and potential structural causes of this inequality in that society remain very much implicit. 
were shielded from view by something that you could call, you know, summarize as loyalty to the motherland, both in a cultural sense and in a political sense. And crucially, uh, a cursory reading of Pitun literature and more widely Butler's literature would lead me to venture that this kind of narrative holds for a large part of this literature. This is not just Xiaohai, this is not the exception to the rule, rather it might be the rule. Xiaohai then again is kind of ambivalent in that respect, maybe even ambiguous. I've said that he's sometimes associated with the anger of a young person, with Sturm und Drang, that kind of thing. But then if there is any anger to speak of in his work, this is very often chalked up to the artist's temperament, conveniently, right? We've talked a little bit about the solitary genius and individualist romanticism. You've seen Xiaohai in action, including pictures of a setting sun. You know, there's uh, plenty of romanticism there for us to kind of dig into to explain that. And so, in fact, several observers have observed that, or have averred, I should say, that after coming to Pitun, Xiaohai has kind of calmed down, right? Now, this could raise an interesting question minimally from the reader's point of view. Is it the case that Xiaohai has been defanged? Has his raw power, yes, I know, individualist romanticism, has his raw power been domesticated? Those kinds of questions. And if we take a step back and kind of look at these things more in terms of, let's say, the organization of the literary field, you could ask whether he has been neutralized, perhaps co-opted, incorporated by the system, by the state discourse. Now, one piece of evidence for making that argument would be that in 2019, Xiaohai, having been recommended by one of the teachers in the Pitun literature group, was invited at no cost to partake in an extensive and intensive course in poetry at the Beijing Laoshe Institute for Literature, which is a very prestigious uh, part of, let's say, the cultural apparatus of the state in contemporary China. So, you know, is this co-optation, is it incorporation? What does it actually mean? How should we read it? I don't think that citing that kind of evidence is actually going to strengthen the case for saying that Xiaohai or Pitsun literature or Battler's literature um, more, more broadly has been incorporated into the state discourse. I don't think so at all. It's not helpful for, uh, helpful for understanding what goes on in cultural production in China today. Of course, we shouldn't lose sight of state power in Chinese literature and art. And the Laosa Institute is one item in a very large toolbox in that regard that has a long history that goes, you know, uh, goes back into imperial history, of course. Um, how does the state see itself in regard to the production of literature and art? Another item in this toolbox, for example, is very sophisticated and extremely far-reaching and effective censorship, right? And this censorship certainly extends to battles poetry. So if I said just now that the narrative minimally emerging from the persona and also from large parts of the literature um, is one of patriotism, of gratitude, and so on and so forth, we should also take that into account. I'm certainly not blocking these things from view. Um, specifically in regard to battles poetry, it is widely known that in China there are so-called black factories. Black factories where black refers to um, illegality, to illegal practices. This is not something that is just kind of tagged onto factories. The, the word black is used um, in that sense in other contexts, institutional contexts in China as well. So I'm not trying to block these things out. We should certainly not lose sight of state power in literature and art in China. but I still don't think that reading, for example, Xiaohai's participation in a course at the Laoshe Institute or his recommendation by a teacher in that literature group um, should you know, lead us to believe that he's been incorporated into the system. I just don't think it makes a lot of sense. It's not helpful. Rather, what it should probably make us do is to revisit and rethink relations of the individual, the community, and the state in cultural production in China today. Now that takes me straight to um, the penultimate um, part of the talk. I'm keeping an eye on the clock, by the way. Um, I hope you're not worried. I hope you're, you know, you're enjoying your popcorn and all of that, and you'll uh, bear with me for a little bit longer. 
So um, this chapter is called Shared Spaces, and this is really an homage to Dai Tianhua, um, Professor of Cultural Studies and, well, of many things at Peking University. And I'm sure some of those in Chinese studies know her work well. Um, what she um, talks about, this notion of shared spaces, can be related um, to similar notions in other theorizations that come, let's say, from other particular backgrounds. But still, I think it is very useful in the Chinese context, not least because she kind of hooked up the notion of the shared space, gong yong kong jian in Chinese, to a distinction of um, unofficial culture on the one hand and official culture on the other, and crucially, to the relativizing of that distinction, which is not to say these categories don't matter anymore. It just means that we need to look at them in conjunction. Now, the shared space in China, and particularly in poetry, brings to mind something that I've been talking about for a couple of years. So some of you who know my work and Christian mentioned Walk on the Wild Side, which is where I really sort of put this forward for the first time, is um, the notion of poetry as a meme in the pre-internet sense. So the cultural sibling of the gene. Poetry, the power of poetry as a meme in Chinese cultural tradition that remains operational today. Um, if you want, if you're interested, uh, again, this is me blowing my own horn, but you know, uh, read Walk on the Wild Side, it's all there. Um, this very importantly includes the notion of poetry as a social practice. And I was very excited to hear that the project of uh, Lyric in Transition in Trier um, is adding another theme of the social embedment of poetry. I'd love to be involved. Uh, with that as well. Now, in the Chinese context, what is striking about poetry as a social practice is that it is very capable of crossing the boundaries between social and professional groups. And then, if we look at the Pichun literature group, we have a fantastic example. So, here you have an image of a meeting of the literature group in the office space of the migrant workers' home. The speaker is Liu Nan of um, the uh, Renmin University of China, a Zhongwu Renmin Daxue. Um, she teaches in this particular session. I remember she was talking about uh, the dissemination of Battler's literature, and to her right, you can actually see Xiao Hai with his um, signature baseball hat. If you look at the Pizza and Literature Group, what are the groups we can identify that kind of you know happily cross over here? Well, first of all, we have the cultural activists that founded uh, the Migrant Workers' Home to begin with. Um, I know that Wang Dezhi, for example. Uh, and probably other members of this core group are often present at these meetings. They sometimes teach there as well. Then there is the migrant workers themselves, the battlers themselves, who voiced an interest in literature and got their group through um, the good offices of Xiao Fu, the um, manager of the migrant workers' home, and somebody with a migrant worker history herself. Then there are academics, intellectuals, literary authors, cultural professionals, people like literary editors working at um, you know, author um, authoritative uh, literary journals in China, for example, people like Zhang Huiyu, the, you know, the sort of the Ur teacher, the Ur lecturer of the group, um, but also foreign scholars, Chinese, China-based scholars, scholars foreign-based scholars, uh, literary professionals like Shi Li Bin, who is the vice editor of Beijing Literature, this journal I mentioned just now, and who recommended Xiao Hai to the Laoshi Institute. Then there are media professionals, people like Yang Yi, who made the video that was published in the China Daily that you saw just now. And then, of course, representatives of the state's actual official cultural apparatus, like the Laoshi Institute. And when Xiao Hai took a course there, I looked at the lineup of the teachers that, you know, I think it was, it was like two weeks or something, and it was full day. Uh, he cherishes very pleasant memories, among other things, because he didn't have to worry about food and drink. And the people who taught that course, um, you know, they are truly famous. Uh, they are high-flying academics and literary authors. So what Dai Tinghua has to say about the notion of the shared space Chinese style, and this is actually the way she says it, is that it is a space of cultural production and experience that blurs these rigid kind of, you know, Cold War type distinctions and divisions of official and unofficial culture. And the easy association of official culture with political power and unofficial culture with resistance. And instead, what she does is to point to the confluence and the interaction of different players, interests and ideologies and infrastructures, rather than their separate separation into 
um, various pigeonholes that are mutually kind of you know sealed off or seal off a bull. Um, notably, she kind of put this forward in the late 1990s, um, so that's about 20 years. Um, but it uh, certainly retains its relevance today um, in various areas of cultural production. Now, one way of approaching the complexity of this dynamic that I've tried to outline is to ask, and this may sound like a very naive question, but how does battle-ass poetry actually work? And what I mean by the question of how it works is what does it do and what does it mean and to whom? Now, those of you who uh, attended my talk in Trier in 2019, and those of you who've met me in other contexts know that I'm kind of uh, crazy about this particular geometric figure, uh, the tetrahedron, because it is the figure that enables us with the maximum number of vertices in the figure um, to talk about things that all are directly connected. So, you know, you can talk about four different vertices and they're all directly connected and they all affect the way we read the thing in the middle, which in this case is piece on literature, but it could be something else. It could be state society relations, uh, whatever. Um, I, you know, I should probably confess that I've also used the tetrahedron when I was an administrator um, trying to build a research agenda. I'm not sure that went down so well, but um, when I wrote the paper that is at the bottom of this presentation, the editor for the special issue that we hope to be doing on this uh, actually encouraged me to include it in the paper. And so, you know, I've done so. This is Paula Jovina of the University of uh, Chicago. And what I see if I try and think about different perspectives or angles on this poetry is, first of all, and that's why I put it at the bottom, the basis, social identification, fulfillment, and the restoration of dignity in the precarious worker as a reading and writing subject. Okay, so I've abbreviated that as social identification. And secondly, testimony and advocacy. So literature in order to tell the world what's going on and perhaps also to advocate for change. Third, aesthetic value. So this would go back to issues of aesthetic expectations and assessments that we talked about earlier. And of course, it's a huge issue. And fourth, the author's socioeconomic betterment. So there are some very famous examples of people who have managed through their writing, and Shohai is in fact arguably an example, to find employment that is less precarious and more meaningful than their work as a migrant worker. Now that is of course an infinitesimal small minority and yet I think we need to talk about this as a potential um, angle to think about this, uh, this poetry. And finally let me wrap this up with a very brief reflection stepping back also stepping back from China uh, of what we could do with this in terms of conceptualizations and uh, theory. And here first of all I should stress that um, this topic, um, not just of battlers poetry or battlers literature, migrant worker literature, but migrant worker literature and culture at large, cultural production. So this also, for example, involves digital video um, and other examples like music that I've mentioned before, is very much a field in the making where I come from, i.e. in Chinese studies, there's a lot of exciting scholarship going on as we speak. There is some very good scholarship out there already, but it is a fledgling tradition. Um, I'm confident that it'll grow to be a true tradition in scholarship, um, but we're not there yet. Now, um, in China, there is uh, tons of scholarship uh, and a lot of media coverage. And of course, at this point, depending on you know, uh, the, the perspective you take, for example, where publications are based, uh, how they relate to the environment and stuff like that, we might also be looking at comparative work. And one thing um, that has been truly striking is uh, how collaborative work uh, across these borders, so to speak, is picking up. And obviously, when I'm talking about Chinese and foreign, I'm talking about China-based and foreign-based. I'm not talking about ethnicities. So, for example, the project that Paula Jovene and Zhang Huiyu, um, both of whom I mentioned earlier on, uh, initiated last year, a workshop in Beijing, uh, involved cultural activists. It involved China-based academics, foreign-based academics, and we're hoping to, uh, you know, to produce something there. 
So this is truly a field in the making. And then what you can do is to do the obvious thing. And I think it's probably useful to do the obvious thing. And I'll borrow a couple of very familiar metaphors. So what I could do as a scholar of Chinese literature is to look vertically at indigenous traditions, at which point, obviously, I'm going to look at the narrative of, let's say, Chinese workers' literature throughout the 20th century and beyond. Okay, uh, very definitely started in the Republican era in the first half of the 20th century. And then for now, I'm not going to go into this now, but for now, one thing to note would be the shifting position and the shifting perception of the state in this narrative. Horizontally speaking, when we talk about transnational comparisons and international comparisons, uh, of course, what we could do is to look at things like working class literature in, in other cultural linguistic traditions. When I set up a course uh, last year for my MA students at Leiden University, actually not just from Chinese studies, but from wherever, the, tors, the course was entirely in English. We looked at traditions in Britain and the US and found very interesting parallels, for example, with Latinx um, immigrants in the contemporary US um, doing precarious labor and uh, cultural production. But one thing that really tickles me and that I hope to have the time for looking into at greater depth is a potential comparison with Dalit poetry from the subcontinent from India. So here I've got one example, and the reason I picked this particular example, so Dalit text, Aesthetics and Politics Reimagined, a recent uh, edited volume, um, is that it kind of shows that I think scholarship on Dalit literature is where scholarship on migrant worker literature and culture in China might be in a few years from now, maybe in a decade from now. Uh, that will make it very inspiring. And uh, I'm gonna say a very predictable thing now, but um, I actually read very widely in this stuff because for one thing, I thought I was gonna be able to work it into this paper. I've had to put that off. It's gonna be part of a monograph project, but I was struck and excited by the fact that on the one hand, I find these striking similarities about the kinds of scholarly questions you can ask, but, you know, and here comes the duh thing, I also found big differences. Uh, these would, in the first instance, to do with political and political um, politics and political institutions, but again, I'm not going to go into that now. I just want to flag this. Um, to wrap this up, I'm at 59 minutes uh, on my stopwatch. I hope you're still with me. This particular topic is eminently suitable to a wide variety of disciplines and themes. Migration studies, labor studies, sociology, anthropology, media studies, cultural studies, and of course, literary studies. And when we look at it from a literary angle, even if we involve ethnographic methods, for example, I think that would probably, what would come to the surface as a couple of sort of core points. In fact, I could build another tetrahedron with this, and my students know about this from the MA course, is we'd be looking at aesthetics, ideology, cultural specificity, which in this case might be Chineseness, but then we could do transnational comparison as well. And finally, translation. And then in the broad sense, not just the conventional interlingual sense, but also cultural translation. And then if we think about aesthetics, uh, well, there's a huge literature on this, of course. Um, I think it's a start for us to acknowledge the truism that aesthetic assessment is co-determined by social and ideological contexts, right? There is no such thing as an aesthetic vacuum. Then we need to call out the zero sum thinking that sees these things as kind of communicating vessels that says either you have high social significance, right? The noble savage, but the literary value is gonna be low or you have high literary value, but that means it probably can't be written by the noble savage, right? We need to call out this zero sum thinking because we need to go back to revisiting the foundations of aesthetic expectations and assessments. And then the challenge becomes for researchers, teachers, and translators, and like I said, they often coincide in the same human bodies, to reflect on how they will position this literature vis-a-vis -vis their students, vis-a-vis -vis their readers who know nothing about China, migrant labor, and so on and so forth. That is what I think we need to be thinking about. Of course, these things are easily associatable, associable, associatable with the global revival of poetry in the 21st century, which I know is one of the cornerstones of the project going on in Trier, or perhaps one of its inspirations. So that can take us to the Q&A. I thank you for your improbable patience. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you, Michael, very much for this very inspiring talk. And we still have quite some time for discussion. Before we begin, I would like to welcome some welcome additions to our audience. For example, Kerstin Storm in Münster and Yang Zhiyi in Frankfurt, and a couple more. So we are growing, getting more influential over time. And uh, a little bit about the etiquette for our discussion. I would propose that everybody turns the microphone off as default. And if you want to talk, then you turn your microphone on. And if you think that nobody else is talking, then you just talk right away. And otherwise you just wait until somebody else has finished their question, but you keep your microphone on. on. This will show me that you want to ask a question, okay? So feel free to turn on your mic microphone. Okay, I think um, I'm Ji Yang, Professor yes. Gravel. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, sorry for, for coming late to, to the Zoom uh, talk. And I find quite interesting that in the middle you, you mentioned Zhang Huiyu's name a few times. He was my classmate at Beidou, right. our undergraduate classmates. And I just sent the link to the Zoom of the, of the Zoom talk to him on WeChat, but he is in, in the middle of something, but he might join us later. But anyway, so my question is that uh, I'm not familiar with the new poetry scene because I'm more working on the old poetry. But in my work on contemporary class, classical style poetry, classicist poetry in contemporary China, also encountered uh, one migrant poet, Zhang Xiaohong, who also won a few poetry prizes. But honestly, I think the prize was more awarded to her identity than to her poetry in a certain sense. And uh, my, because because uh, I'm familiar with Zhang Huiyu's work, and I knew that he was also uh, he's also so associated with the Marxist reading groups, and you know that the Peking University student Marxist study group had been banned by the authorities last year, and also some efforts by university Marxist intellectuals trying to work together with the with the with the workers and maybe organize some workers union, perhaps eventually strikes and all these activities were banned. So I, I, I'm, uh, I find it interesting that the state, of the state power has an interesting relation with the migrant worker poets here. On one hand, all these hard measures like workers union, labor union or strike would be harshly cracked crack down. On the other, these poetry, these artistic expressions are more or less promoted by the state media. So just to wonder if there's a complicity here, namely that the power actually works with the workers to let out the steam as long as they do not boil over to be the hard protest. Thank you. Um, so Christian, I take it that I should respond to this question rather than harvest other questions first? Yes, just uh, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Young, great to meet you, uh, even though it's on screen. I know your work um, and it's, it's wonderful that you've joined today. Thank you. So, um, no, uh, absolutely true uh, what you say about, let's say, um, two big points that I take away from your question. One is the example of Zhang Xiaohong, where you said, I really believe the award was, um, was given to her more on account of her identity than on account of the, shall we say, the literary quality, maybe those are my words, of her uh, writing and the other point about let's say the relation between um, state power on the one hand and cultural production including grassroots cultural production on the other and very interestingly you used uh, the term complicity toward the end um, and I recall um, a uh, crucial article by uh, Michelle Yeh that I think probably many of us have read a 1996 article where she first talked about the cult of poetry and where the other way around, she talked about complicity of um, the contemporary, let's say, post-socialist poetry with political orthodoxy, precisely because the early, um, late 1970s, early 1980s uh, poetry, the first poetry written or published in the post-socialist era, clearly echoed that politically orthodox word, uh, work from uh, the high socialist era. And of course, by speaking of complicity, 
uh, you are implying a particular uh, position. So if I'm going to be a little bit provocative or just, you know, or just difficult, uh, then I might say that we usually uh, speak of complicitousness or complicity in the context of a crime. Um, and um, we could work with that. We could talk about that. I think it really depends on your perspective. I also think that your observation that the state might be doing this, um, that is the sponsorship of cultural production by migrant workers in order for them to be able to let off steam lest it boils over is right on the money. It's totally on the mark. It is a well-known mechanism, not just, I think, in the sense of allowing people to let off steam, but also as a very um, tried and tested way for the regime to assess what is actually going on, what people are actually talking about. So if we look, I mean, I'm sorry to have to talk about the C word today, but I'm reminded if we look at what happened, um, you know, with the Corona crisis and the way that, let's say, the uh, propaganda apparatus uh, operate in the PRC, we see a similar pattern where in the beginning there was some space for um, um, noises expressing dissatisfaction with certain things, et cetera, et cetera, doubtless for the state in order to get a sense of what was going on. Uh, and later on, when the machine went into full throttle, there was much less space for those things. I think um, to wrap this up, that in the case of uh, migrant worker cultural production, um, the picture might be bigger. But I also think, judging from what I know of your own work, that you'd probably agree with me there, um, that while these things are true, at the same time, I think it is helpful for us to entertain a perspective that quite simply says, it's in the regime's interests, and it might also be their sincere, um, heartfelt desire to improve the situation of uh, a demographic of which large parts have felt like they are second class citizens. Out of idealism, out of socioeconomic calculation, no matter what the motivation, but I do believe that if anybody's on the ball in trying to improve matters in that respect, um, it is. Uh, the Chinese government. However, they are in a double bind because basically um, migrant labor is an important part of the engine that drives economic growth. Um, so in that sense, you know, I guess they're navigating a very, um, a very difficult tightrope uh, in that respect. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. More questions? May I? Yes. Uh, hi, Magia. Thanks for your wonderful talk. And um, I wanted to ask you, what do you make? Uh, I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions, actually. Um, the first one is directly related to Xiao Hai. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what do you make of Xiao Hai's intertextuality? Um, more precisely, uh, okay. Uh, his pen name is a direct reference to Haizi, and he has written a lot of poems based on songs by Bob Dylan, by John Lennon, and so on and so forth. Uh, not to mention all the references to Haizi himself in his, in his, in his, in his poetic production. Uh, so, uh, first of all, um, is it part of what you said, like uh, of going beyond the uh, very easy dichotomy be between unofficial and official poetry, institutional poetry and amateur poetry? Because we can also see poets themselves as a sort of shared spaces, right? Um, and is it something common in Butler's poetry at large? I mean, to th this intertextual element, this intertextual characteristic that is it's so poignant in Xia Hai. Is it, is it a common sight? In Butler's poetry at large, and then, and then I would like to ask you to, um, if you could elaborate a bit more on what you uh, were suggesting about the translation of Butler's poetry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess I owe you that. So, um, for the others in the room, I should immediately, um, without having asked his permission, cite an email uh, from Federico. Um, in which he told me that uh, Xiao Hai actually confessed to him that he hadn't finished reading Allen Ginsberg's Howl. So, so much for intertextuality. Well, uh, theoretically, of course, that doesn't detract from intertextuality at all. Um, but I think it is, it is um, you know, beyond kind of, you know, jesting about this. I think it is useful information. It's in interesting to note this because it kind of triggers me to talk about what I, 
perceive as a modus of intertextuality, if you will, um, in this case. To um, go to the end of your first question, I think that Xiaohai is pretty extreme in his explicit intertextual references, right? Um, and among these, I count both moments in the actual text of the poems themselves and the kind of postscripts that he does all the time. Uh, where he explains that a particular poem was really inspired by Bob Dylan, uh, and so on and so forth. Secondly, um, what I find interesting about intertextuality, not just in Xiaohai um, or in Battler's poetry, but in contemporary Chinese poetry at large, and I'm not sure that this is something that is limited to China, is what I would summarize as the relative superficialness of the intertextual references. So I remember a couple of years ago, I had an idea for a research project. I'm sure all of us every now and then have an idea for a research project um, that doesn't come to fruition. And it's one of those things I've been thinking about. Um, when I realized that just about any poet that I had heard talk about foreign literature in China had cited Allen Ginsberg as an important influence. But these poets come from completely different backgrounds in terms of aesthetics completely and utterly different. So how does that work? How is it that Allen Ginsberg, and more specifically how, you know, turns out to be cited as an inspiration to people who do totally different things in literature? And so you get to the point where you sense perhaps that um, one function of this intertextuality might be more like almost a surface inspiration. Um, because I believe that, you know, if you know how, um, I can see why Xiaohai would want to use the notion of howling, of screaming in pain and anger to label his poetry, but I cannot really relate it that well to Ginsburg, um, to my reading of Ginsburg. So that's your first question. As for translation, um, yeah, um, so translation is, uh, tra tra translating poetry is choosing time and again which rule to break. Uh, I do believe in this aphorism, um, and I think it is um, perhaps something that is actually inherent to the genre, um, and that kind of positions us in a particular way when we talk about the translation of poetry. There's the, the naked sociological fact that for as long as we know, as long as the written record, uh, humans have said that translating poetry is impossible, and they have also continued to translate poetry. So that's an interesting uh, observation. It is demonstrably not impossible, minimally from a sociological angle. And then what I said about um, the question of whether in translating Battler's poetry you might actually be breaking a rule that says pay attention to lexical detail. Now obviously this was a little cheeky, right? What are you going to pay attention to if not lexical detail um, in translating poetry? Yet at the same time when I found myself translating large you know, swaths of uh, Xiaohai's poetry in preparing for the paper and then discarding some and using others, I found that that is actually what I was doing. Whereas I consider myself a translator of poetry with uh, a particularly overbearing conscience, I mean overbearing to the point where it can be really uh, annoying for other people, right, my conscience. So um, that's kind of what got me thinking about it. I think I was trying to get a sense of, of the flow, of the breathlessness, of the hurriedness sometimes, of the sort of whipping it out, slamming it down on paper, sense of some of this work, and trying to copy that. And this is, of course, a very old trope in translation studies, to aim for something like a similar effect in the target language. Uh, but I'm ready to be challenged on this. I'm not just ready, I actually... I was hoping to be challenged on it. So thank you for rising to the challenge. Thank you very much. I think Matthias Fechner is next. Oh, well, excellent perception. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, Magil van Krevel, thank you very much for your very inspiring uh, presentation and talk. And I, I can follow your comparison with Dalit literature, but not 100%. I think Dalit uh, poetry is mostly about race and, and case inspired uh, by those uh, factors. And Dalit poetry also has powerful mediators. Um, 
like uh, the poet Barabar Rao, who has gone uh, to prison most recently, or uh, the poet Gulzar, who has penned a big poem on the plight of migrant workers um, in the Punjabi area, or uh, the singer Gadar. Um, and I, I believe that uh, the school system, which enables migrant workers to write poetry in China, must probably be more um, solid. The teaching must be more solid than in India, Pakistan, or in Bangladesh. And I think there are many um, factors which do not work in your comparison. But it would be interesting to see um, what this means. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to, to speak to a specialist on this subject. All I have been doing <clears throat> uh, so far is reading about it um, and looking forward to uh, meeting somebody who I'm working with in, in the UK, um, Francesca Orsini. Um, I think she's in Hindi literature. I'm not sure if she's worked on, on Dalit. Thank you for correcting my pronunciation there as well, uh, literature. So, so great addition. I'm not a specialist. Um, I would, um, well, a very convincing, um, uh, a very convincing con man then, because you certainly look like a specialist. So, no, I'd rather look like a con man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, this is an academic conference. So, um, first of all, I would challenge you on your conclusion to your question, because you said there are many factors where your comparison would not work. I believe the differences you indicated would actually make the comparison work. Um, the differences will be as instructive um, as the similarities. Um, but this is really sophistry, uh, really a moot point. Um, what, I, uh, what I find very interesting is your immediate comment um, that, of course, a lot of Dalit poetry or uh, among the primary movers of Dalit poetry in terms of motivation is race um, and uh, caste. Um, you mentioned it's powerful mediators. So I'll say two things to this. One is that when I started reading about Dalit poetry, and I started with this early 1990s book uh, by somebody called, I think, Eleanor Zelliot, working together with, with I forget the name. Um, and then I looked up a lot of scholarship and sort of read a lot of additional poetry and found that there are these kind of edited volumes in English now uh, drawing together scholars working in different traditions, which is, to my mind, something that uh, Chinese migrant worker cultural production could really sort of work towards as well. I was struck that aside by the fact that aside from where this comes from, what drives it, the kind of experience that is highlighted, mm -hmm. for example, second class citizenry, yes. Um, yes. is very much comparable. And yeah. so, in fact, the differences that you point out mm -hmm. might enable us um, to, to look, to discern more sharply how the poetry itself actually works. What you have to say about, so the second point that I want to respond to before opening up the floor again, um, is this thing about powerful mediators, because I didn't have time for this today because um, the paper is actually quite um, substantive, but there is a section in the paper where I uh, go into what I've called the lucky break. Okay, so um, let's think about this in very crude sociological terms. Structure, agency, and the lucky break, right? Now, if you're a migrant worker, um, not a migrant worker poet, but a migrant worker aspiring to become a poet or an author, then chances are, and of course I need to sort of super simplify here, chances are that structure works against you in terms of social class, in terms of gender as applicable, there's a lot of literature uh, focusing on the gender issues in migrant worker cultural production in terms of education, in terms of employment. Agency um, might speak to things like your talent and your dedication, right? And then you need that lucky break. Now, any artist, not just in China and not just a migrant worker artist, needs a lucky break. There are very few who don't need a lucky break, a moment that kind of enables you to access cultural capital. But what I've been struck by as I read sort of widely in this migrant worker poetry is how many of the biographies of the successful authors very clearly identify one moment as that lucky break, even if they don't call it that themselves. So in the case of Xiaohai, this was him connecting on social media with Zhang Tu, who wrote back to him, actually he started correspondence, sending him books, and then put him in touch with Xu Duo, 
who persuaded him to come to Pitun, where he joined the literature group, where Fan Yu Su went viral, and so on and so forth. But if we look at Deng Xiaoqiong, who is the most famous migrant worker poet um, in China today, she had her lucky break when her employer decided to give her time off to write to finish a collection of poetry and sponsored her participation in a state-sponsored um, youth poetry conference in, 2000 of, in 2005. And so I could go on, for example, Guo Jinyo, who read at Poetry International in Rotterdam in 2014, his channel, his conduit, was Yang Lian, who is a world-renowned uh, poet, um, probably well, extremely widely translated in, in, in German, among many other languages. Um, and so I think those mediators are actually in place. Um, what I could add to this is that in my experience of attending a conference on migrant worker culture in Hengxi, just south of Nanjing, I was struck by the fact that the local government kind of came in uh, sponsoring the conference very, very generously, but that also meant that they were going to chair it. So we got cultural officials chairing the conference, um, you know, which wasn't an obstacle. I mean, these people, yeah, let us talk. Um, of course, being a foreign based scholar, um, I wasn't in the same situation as the practitioners in China, but um, I felt no problems there. And the phenomenon of the state kind of getting involved with this. Um, is obvious. One final point, because you very perceptively said something about the school system. Of course, there are 300 million migrant workers roughly since the 1980s in China, right? Now, it's certainly not the case that every single one of them um, has the kind of level of literacy uh, or the individual interests to even be, let's say, mechanically, instrumentally capable of writing poetry. So that's a very good point. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, we have now two people who raised their hands. The first being Daniel Yuryev. Three people. Yeah, Daniel Yuryev, next. Yes, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. And actually, my question aiming at the just mentioned Xiaochong. Uh, which uh, I happen to know be, because she's one of the few Chinese contemporary poets that are translated into uh, thanks to an anthology published 2016 by Lea Schneider. And uh, she's one of the few poets who are presented, and uh, she's also about the were uh, poetry and um, things uh, I learned from there. I'd like to point out because they might um, help something in perspective, or maybe just it appears to me like that. So, so um, first of all, uh, 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 the editor doesn't mention that. Uh, Zheng Xiaochong uh, did that break, rather the narrative there is that she surprisingly won a big literary prize, the Li Chun Prize, yeah. uh, in 2007. And uh, uh, yeah, and nobody knew about her, but uh, apparently since you could Quote story from 2005. That's uh, a bit of a simplification. But I noted that uh, Xiao Hai also started his uh, writing of poetry in 2007, or at least his uh, uh, started to write with uh, a great continuity. At least that was mentioned in the video. Might, might it be that? It's, uh, Surprising event of 2007 had some that uh, this marks the point um, more bad poetry emerged or tried to, to um, look for a bigger audience. That would be perhaps the first question. The second would be about the prince. Uh, you mentioned uh, 
between what we might expect and the reality is, is that they or at least Xiao Hai uh, don't particularly seem to blame anyone or at least not uh, the uh, society ever this seems to be strongly contrasted with the work of Zheng Xiao Xiong, Xiong who writes uh, things such as uh, the illness of society being uh, even worse than the physical pain and so on. So is she uh, the exception or is it just that uh, this is because she is earlier and what you seem to have presented rather in development? That would be my two questions. Thank you very much. So um, on your first question, uh, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed, but I'm going to self cite again. Uh, if you're interested, there is an open access article called The Cultural Translation of um, Battler's Poetry. The Cultural Translation of Battler's Poetry. Anyway, if you can't find it, email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. And uh, I think it is there that I went into some detail about this perception of Zheng Xiaoqiong um, kind of, you know, changing ranks uh, when she also became a member of the Writers Association and stuff like that. Uh, so I can, I can give you some more detail on that. Uh, the image of the lucky break, uh, in fact, in her case, I mean, there are many moments you could point to, and even earlier moments, which I think is just as instrumental, but has been less publicized, is that when she had just arrived in Dongguan from Sichuan, and she started uh, being a factory worker, she wanted to write, and she wrote, um, a very influential person in the unofficial poetry circuit, uh, Fa Xin, who is in uh, um, Liang San, uh, in Pugo, um, basically asking him for advice. And then Fa Xin, being an established poet in the unofficial scene, sent her a whole bunch of books and journals and uh, guidance and that kind of thing. Anyway, um, we can talk more about this. So, of course, uh, the prize in 2007 was, was really important. Um, by the way, it was a prize for essay writing, not poetry writing. But fortunately, she stuck to poetry afterwards. I mean, I, I believe we are fortunate to have her as a poet. Um, as for the year 2007 as a, as a special year, um, when we look at Xiao Hai, in fact, um, his collected uh, works, so the book that you saw when, you know, in the video, uh, that he was leafing through his collection of poetry doesn't really start in 2007. Um, I think it starts in the period leading up to 2012, mostly when he is trying his hand at classical poetry, but he probably started to write sort of, you know, I mean, basically started writing practice around that time. Uh, minimally, he says so in the video. Um, then his writing of the poetry that he kind of stands by today uh, really starts from 2012, uh, from 2012. So I'm not sure that the year 2007 is in any way um, special in that respect if we take a macro view of literary history. Uh, but I'd be glad to look at that more. As for the question of blaming, or rather not blaming, um, you know, particular people or institutions for the hardships of precarious labor, um, there are many people who have said things like, uh, you know, illness of society, there are things wrong in this society. Uh, but that is very different from a direct indictment of the government. Now, there, of course, we should take censorship into account um, because there is that kind of poetry, but it doesn't get published. Um, if it gets published, um, it, it becomes impossible to cite it, for example, in anthologies with wider circulation. In fact, one of the other things I'd wanted to do in this paper, but you know, couldn't really fit it in, was a comparison with somebody who speaks a narrative in their poetry um, that is much more bitter, much more angry um, than the kind of stuff that you see in Xiao Hai um, and in Pichun literature. And so we could probably tentatively uh, draw two conclusions from this. One is that it's certainly not the case that this, you know, gratitude, patriotism, um, and positive energy holds across the board. 
although I do believe that it holds for large parts of this cultural production. So it's not an exception. It's not just Pitun or just Xiaohai. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, let's say, more direct, straightforward indictments or the breaching of cultural taboos, such as straightforward writing about um, LGBT issues, uh, gets effectively censored, which means that if it is published, this happens in unofficial publications, and it often happens in one-off publications. It doesn't really get circulated um, in canonizing anthologies and that kind of thing. So I think Xiao Chung, uh, Zheng Xiaoqiong is um, one of the reasons that make her so fascinating is how she juggles the force field um, that she finds herself in the middle of. Um, because this is amazing. I mean, she is a celebrity. She's a star. She travels the world. And the way she handles social media, the way she handles it in her writing, both her poetry and her essays, the way she reflects upon her own development as a poet, and the way she manages to be a very high up person um, in uh, an official journal, she's vice editor in chief of uh, Zhuopin in Guangzhou, um, and to you know, partake in the five yearly session of the national meeting of the Writers Association in Beijing, that kind of thing on the one hand, and to retain her credibility with the rank and file of migrant worker literature on the other is just amazing. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Um, and it also strikes me from my personal contact with her. So I do a lot of field work, a lot of ethnography, a lot of interviewing, a lot of sort of hanging out, uh, participant observation. And so I've met Xiao Chung many times over the years. Um, also met her when she read a poetry international in Rotterdam uh, and read this poetry to a, a full house of over a thousand uh, people here. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary, actually. Um, so, yeah, she's special in many respects. I sorry, we have three other questions, persons who would like to uh, give a question, Joanna G and Alessandro, perhaps we can collect them and uh, then answer briefly. Yes. Okay. I think it was uh, Wang Rui, uh, Rui Kunze also had a question, right? And Joanna and who else? Well, I think Joanna- G and is, Alessandro. Uh, okay, uh, Joanna, I think was the first one. So we collect all the questions and then give Mahir time to answer. Okay, thank you very much, Mahir. It was really great to see you again. And uh, I have four questions, but rather short ones. So I, I will try to be quick. The first one is, uh, I know Xiao Hai, he was inspired by Haidze in choosing his name, but is he aware of the other poet called Xiao Hai? Uh, I mean, the, probably the third generation poet and uh, uh, because there was a sort of situation like that before with two Jianghe's. So I think it's not a problem that he simply didn't Google it out before, I mean, by Duisha and didn't realize that there is another Xiaohai. And the second question is to, um, to what extent does he have uh, that kind of meta-awareness of his position? Does he reflect on this, that he might be appropriated or co-opted by, by that state discourse, or does it take it uh, at face value that he is invited for those workshops and so on and so on? And the third question is about translation. Uh, because I was very surprised by what you said about that um, breaking the rule of, uh, let's say, that lexical faithfulness in translation of migrant workers' poetry, because I have totally opposite um, experience with this, because if, if I translate another kind of poetry, it's not a problem for me to read a stanza and simply rewrite it, but when I read migrant workers' poetry, I feel so much involved in all those, me all those mechanisms, that machinery, physical particles, like elements of those uh, devices that I simply cannot just so easily separate myself from this. So I think this is very important to, to, to feel that climate of, the, of those factors. This is the material from which this poetry is made. And uh, the, f the last thing uh, is about your aphorism. Uh, about breaking one rule, I want to ask, do you have any, say, 
baseline set of rules, a baseline paradigm from which you start, from which you choose the rules to break, or perhaps the problem is that you first have to invent the rule that you want to break, because okay. I guess yeah. there is no canon of rules. Okay. So, yeah, that, that, these are all my questions. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Alessandro. Yeah, thank you very much for this great talk, very, very briefly. So in your opinion, to, to which extent is, um, does he think his poetry, his activity, his persona, his public figure can actually impact, can actually make a change in society and make various audiences both uh, in his uh, environment in China and abroad as well through translation of course uh, to which extent this can create awareness both in China and worldwide and of course this also means who is uh, his um, ideal reader ideal audience I mean coming yep. from from an intermediate point of view that's that's just it okay okay and last question is Roy did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, I do have quite two questions. Okay. <laughs> um, again, nice to see everybody. Thank you, Mathieu, for the talk. I have two questions. Be quick. The first question is uh, um, the four elements you you listed uh, around the Peter literature. Um, I want to ask uh, what is the stakes or the risk of uh, social identification? Because uh, I have the impression that uh, when I'm working with migrant worker or betters worker, uh, Bettler's poetry, this um, I issue of identification is very difficult to handle, or very, de uh, very tricky. Um, like for, for, for critics, for example, uh, would this social identification or assumption of social identification directly affect how you would interpret the poems, what poems you, you, you choose, and what sort of uh, books ever you look at? Um, and for the authors, this social identification, I mean, where do they, uh, do, at what moment do they cross the boundary of this social identification? Uh, again, we have these uh, um, examples of Zheng Xiaoqiong and Xie Xiangnan. You actually writing, uh, wrote in your cultural trans, uh, translation. They actually moved uh, away from their status of a bachelor or migrant worker. And uh, do they still feel this? identification with uh, those workers do they want to i mean there is a tension uh, this is social and uh, literary um attempt or um, struggle to identify or to struggle out of the identification so i would like to ask you how do you think of these stakes there and um, second question is about uh, actually authenticity about this non-fiction uh, non-fiction thing you mentioned, uh, you, you, you listed, uh, read us here. Um, so my, my, of course, so far we see that uh, one of the technique of authenticity is either for critics or for authors, they foreground the, idea, uh, the identity, their identity as migrant worker or their personal experience as migrant worker to authenticate what they write. Um, are there any other techniques or um, strategies uh, people use or do, have you detect um, that is used uh, to authenticate the, or to make the issue of authenticity important in the poem? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, we have technically the last, three last minutes question by G. Yes, and uh, Henrike, how should we proceed? That's the last question by G. Chen from okay. Australia. We have three minutes left, so we can collect the questions and then continue as long as we are still able to. Okay, last question, please. Ethan, we don't hear you. Turn on your microphone, please. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, I'm from Australia. Hello to everyone. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. We can discuss about contemporary Chinese poetry. And what puzzles me most when I engage in this project is that what is the aesthetic criterion or aesthetic and ethical criterion that we can use to select Chinese um, contemporary poetry, which might be long lasting um, over the time. Thank you very much. Okay.
I'm going to try and do this in two minutes, right? <laughs> I'm going to start with the last question. I don't think we can identify a single set of criteria um, that will enable us to predict um, what of contemporary Chinese poetry or Battlers poetry, for that matter, is going to last. Then the penultimate question. I have not observed any other techniques in particular for, let's say, authenticating one's experience beyond the fact of providing biographical background. Um, as for the stakes of social identification, Wang Rui's first question, I agree that these are high and that um, it is tricky, and this is visible in the critical um, debate on migrant worker cultural production um, that we have seen unfold actually uh, ever since the early um, 2000s. And there are people who cross those boundaries if you go by the facts of their CV. I mean, if Zheng Xiaoqiong is now the vice editor of Zopin, that's a different ball game from being, you know, an assembly line worker in Dongguan. Um, however, what I feel is important is that we shouldn't be judging by CVs. I do believe that some sort of first of a hand experience of the migrant worker life is important, but I would never intend to use that as some kind of test, right? I simply believe that that's how the literature works. Alessandro, thank you for your question and nice uh, meeting you and meet, nice meeting Chen Yi as well. At one way we've met before. So um, as for Xiao Hai's sense of the potential impact he might have with his writing, my impression is that this is not foremost on his mind, but I think the bigger issue that you touch upon here is actually very important for the Pichun community. Because if you read the literature on that community, and that's been going on for a bit longer, so we have some good scholarship also by social scientists, not necessarily focusing on cultural production, about their encounters with the local government, including the police. There's been a couple of times that the village has almost been raised to the ground. Then you would conclude that they have very expertly navigated this force field of, let's say, state power on the one hand, including criteria for cultural production, and grassroots impulses and ideals on the other. My sense is that the activists in Pizun would want more than they can currently do. But when I said they expertly navigate the terrain, that is exactly what I mean, because I think it's actually very effective. To Joanna, then, in the opposite order of your questions, no, I don't have a canonical set of rules <laughs> to break. Um, and when you cite my aphorism, it's important to remember that, um, you know, I didn't say anything about breaking rules. I said something about choosing which rule to break, because the fun thing about it is that it's not always the same rule. Then what you said about lexicality, you have the opposite experience when you look at migrant workers' poetry from what I described about lexicality. Perhaps I should explain what I mean by lexical detail, but we have no time. Then I will take this as evidence for the undefinability of poetry and the undefinability of the translation of poetry. And that should keep us, all of us, employed for a while. Then on your question of the meta-awareness of Xiao Hai, of his potential co-optation by state discourse, I am not sure, and this is not meant to sort of, you know, um, downplay the importance of your question. Um, I'm not sure that I could gauge this in Xiao Hai. Um, I do believe it's, it's clear that certainly the people who organize the NGO, the Migrant Workers' Home, very, very continuously think about this stuff and are fully aware of it. And your first and my question and my last answer, I don't know if Xiao Hai is aware of the other poet called Xiao Hai. Um, I can tell you that in WeChatting, I have occasionally sent messages to the wrong poet. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Mark, here for being so quick on time uh, before people start dropping out. But I think it was a very good talk and a very fruitful discussion. And we probably could continue still for a couple hours. And now I think maybe Henrique Stahl still has some announcements or things to tell us. No, I have no other announcement. In the evening, we have the next paper uh, read in Russian by Anna Glasova. But uh, nothing more now. Thank you, Mahi, for your amazing lecture, and I hope we will see you again live in Trier. And we will meet again uh, via Zoom or mail, telephone, phone, um, to discuss our plans for the second period of the funding of our project. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'd love to be involved. Thank you again for the opportunity. <laughs>
Fine. So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, and I hope we will see you again um, to another lecture on Chinese topics. I don't know, will we have another one, Christian? Yes, Maybe? We, we are still planning to have another one but it will not be in the main slot in Wednesday probably it's another day because all our Wednesday slot slots are already filled so far but it's we will announce it in one or two weeks I think okay then thank you have a nice day goodbye everyone and someone of you will be see later um, for the talk with Anna Glasapa